Um, she's still trying to get online, but it should be happening anytime soon. Um, I hope everything is right. And yeah, I'm now online on YouTube. And welcome everyone. Today we are going to be doing a coach session on um, play the Queen's Gambit, which is a very interesting opening and also is a very interesting play the Queen's Gambit. Oh, sorry, a very interesting uh, structure because the main uh, structure that you're going to get if you play the Queen's Gambit decline is the Cosbot structure. So the Cosbot structure is a name that you have to remember. It's going to be heard very often in the stream. And let's have a look at what the Cosbot structure actually is. So the Queen's Gambit decline starts with the moves d4, d5, c4, attacking the pawn. Um, we go e6, protecting the pawn. And the Cosbot structure is a structure that arises after the move c takes d5, e takes d5. And in this structure, um, basically what uh, makes this the Cosbot structure is the pawns on d4 and d5. But also especially that the e-pawn has been traded against the c-pawn. And this is a very, very uh, important structure. Uh, for one d4 players, for one for white players, but also for black players. It's a structure that can very often arise from different openings, openings that are very uh, similar. Um, it can, for example, ri arise after um, one d4, knight f6, c4, e6. And in these positions, uh, black very often puts the pawn on d5 anyway. We recently saw a game, for example, by Magnus Carlsen against Aronian. Um, I think in which Carlsen went um, maybe actually already c takes d5 here. And went for this structure. He went uh, for knight c3, some bishop b7, bishop b4. And basically he just wanted to play this structure and uh, thought it would be an interesting way to play for, for a game. Um, however, today we're going to be talking about the Queen's Gambit decline, and the Dean's, uh, Queen's Gambit decline is a very specific opening. Start with the move d4, d5, c4, and here the opening d takes c4 is called the Queen's Gambit accepted. So you take the pawn sacrifice. Uh, white will almost always get this pawn back on c4. Um, you can, for example, play e3 or even e4, uh, followed by bishop takes c4. Um, this is also a very very interesting opening for black. Um, it's it's definitely okay for black, uh, objectively speaking, but it's just a, a very very different opening. And in this uh, queen's gambit uh, declined, we don't want to give it the center just yet. We want to have her pawn remain in the center on d5, and um, yeah, just just one not not want to give up space. Um, usually white responds to this move by playing knight to c3. That is because um, after knight f3, uh, black is very flexible. Uh, black can, for example, play the move knight to f6. And usually white kind of wants to punish us for going d5 followed by e6 uh, with the move knight to c3. Because if you go uh, one knight f6, for example, you have uh, c4, e6, and here knight c3 is usually not met with d5. It's however usually met with the move bishop to b4, which is called the Nimzo. Um, I don't think d5 is a mistake. I think d5 is a perfectly fine move. However, via this move order, usually black goes bishop to b4. If knight to f3, um, instead of knight c3, you can play d5. And um, the thing is that why this is not as critical as this knight to c3 d5 line is because the knight on g1 very often also wants to go to the e2 square. Um, the knight almost always wants to go to c3 anyway. So uh, playing knight to c3 first is more flexible. Um, black has many ways to play. So it makes a lot of sense to keep the knight on g1 to then adapt to black's uh, setup and then to choose if you go to f3 or to e2. 
Um, why is preferred? Why is bishop is preferred over bishop g5 nowadays? Uh, good question. Um, basically, it just depends on the position. Um, I wanted to have a talk about the main line, for example, um, which is this knight to c3 move. Um, and usually black plays knight to f6 here. And this was uh, a very big main line back in the days, uh, decades ago, basically. Uh, these days, top players don't really go for this um, because it's not very forcing. And it didn't have such a great reputation when the engines started to rise. That was because of the line c takes d5, e takes d5, bishop to g5, pinning the knight, threatening to take an f6, because it forces g takes f6, so let's say black plays a bit of a random move, a6, you play bishop takes f6, and after queen takes f6, you lose the pawn on d5, so that's a bad blunder, so you have to take back with the pawn on f6, and uh, you have completely ruined your structure. Um... So this is definitely not something you want to allow. So what black usually does is pawn to c6 and um, white goes e3. Remaining very, very flexible um, because black, uh, white still wants to decide whether he wants to go knight f3 or knight to e2 later on in the game. Uh, it's not clear yet how black is going to set up his pieces. So it makes sense to um, uh, have the knight still in g1. And the call spot structure, uh, in the in this structure, it's very important to have a look at the minor pieces. Um, which minor pieces you should be trying to keep on the board as black, uh, which minor pieces white wants to keep on the board. And on the other end, also which minor pieces you should be trying to trade. Um, because there are some minor pieces that are, in general, not that great. Um, as a rule of thumb, in general, I would try to actually be trying to exchange minor pieces in general for black in this structure. So every minor piece trade I think is very welcome by black, but you have to be a bit careful of course, uh, because in general you do not really want to give up bishops or knights. So it's not like you can trade everything that you uh, get the opportunity to trade too. Um, uh, so let's have a look at where the minor pieces are even supposed to go. So usually the Okay, the knight's already on f6, so that's already clear where it's going. Um, this bishop usually goes to e7 or d6. The reason for this is um, on the d6 square, it's very active um, because very often white castles king side, so it makes a lot of sense to put already pressure on the king side. So, one move here, for example, is bishop to d6, and the other move or the other main move in this position is bishop to e7. Um, the reason for that is that our knight was pinned, so we want to get rid of this pin. And later on we have some ideas of knight to e4, trying to exchange the pieces and get rid of the pressure on the diagonal. So, um, as I have said already, uh, we want to exchange minor pieces, so knight to e4 in the future makes a lot of sense. Let's say white plays h3, then knight to e4 uh, already might be exchanging two minor pieces because after bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, knight takes e4, and now either queen takes e4 or d takes e4, uh, we've managed to exchange two minor pieces and we should be probably quite happy about that. Um, h3 is of course not a great move, um, but let's have a look at the other minor pieces. We've already talked a bit about the knight on f6 and we've talked about the bishop. One reason, by the way, why the bishop should not be going to b4 is that there's, in general, not a lot of pressure on this diagonal, uh, especially as the knight is pinned, knight to e4 will not be an option. Um, it can easily be protected by the, uh, with knight to e2 anyways. And you also don't want to exchange a bishop for a knight, so bishop to b4 in general does not make a whole lot of sense. In the variation after bishop takes f6 and g takes f6, isn't the bishop pair in the open g5 enough compensation for the weak pawn structure for black? Um, yeah, Narayanan, uh, in the Queen's Gambit declined, is it wise to castle kingside or queenside? Uh, we'll get to that later on in the lecture. Um, there are a lot of things that are interesting. Um, for now, my quick answer is that usually you want to uh, castle kingside, but there might be some exceptions in which you might be casting queenside. But the general rule of thumb is that you castle kings, uh, kingside in this structure. Um, usually in chess, actually, you often castle kingside. 
Um, it's not as often that you castle queenside, more often you castle kingside. The reason for that is actually a very simple one. Uh, if you want to castle kingside, you have to remove the queen, bishop, and knight. While on the kingside, you only have to remove the bishop and knight. So uh, it takes one more move to castle queenside. So it makes more sense to uh, castle kingside as it gets our king earlier out in the out of the center. Um, but we'll get to more of that later. Um, so the another question was, um, doesn't the open G file and the bishop pair compensate for the uh, pawn structure? The thing is that usually double pawns are not that bad. Um, very often, for example, you have the um, the Rue Lopez exchange uh, in which you give up the bishop for the uh, pawn structure as well. The thing though is that here... Um, we have a better pawn structure than in the other position because in the other position um, we had less pawn islands. Right now we only have two pawn islands. While in the other position that we had, um, let me let me get to that position again. Um, a6 bishop takes f6, g takes f6. We're missing this pawn on g7 in comparison to, to the previous position, which means that uh, right now we have. Three pawn, uh, pawn islands, while in the other position, two pawn islands. So we have one more pawn island than white, which in general not great. Um, and that is the reason why uh, this is the the bishop doesn't compensate for the pawn structure. Um, eventually, the uh, f pawns will get weak, probably because the thing is that because we're having three pawn islands, we have a lot of pawns isolated. Both F pawns are isolated, they don't have a G or E pawn next to them, and also the H pawns isolated. So the pawn structure is just too bad um, to be compensated for the bishop and the open G file. Because, for example, at some point white might play G3, and there's simply not a lot going on on the G file. While the position is still kind of closed, with the pawn still being in the center, um, so also the position is not open enough for the bishop to be uh, that great so the bishop pair doesn't compensate yet for the uh, pawn structure um, the spiel wolf i think black can start with bishop b7 then knight f6 so white has to commit knight to on f3 loses the flexibility um well white i think is never really forced to play knight to f3 uh, for example one major line is bishop to e7 here um, with the idea indeed to lure the knight to f3 and then go knight f6. Um, however, in this line, for example, one major line for white is takes, takes, and then go bishop f4. After knight f6, uh, the bishop is on f4 instead of g5. However, the bishop is still very, very active in this structure, uh, in the cause blood structure. The bishop is just quite good on this diagonal as well as it is on this diagonal. So it's not so big of a deal for white that he had to put the bishop on this diagonal. Meanwhile, white can go e3, bishop to d3, and eventually you can still decide whether to put the knight to f3 or e2. So white is definitely not forced to put the knight to f3. Um, but let's get to this position. Uh, c6 was played e3, and now we have to decide where to put the bishop, either to e7 or d6. Um, bishop e7 used to be the old main line, kind of. Um, but uh, things have kind of changed. These days, the main idea is actually to put the bishop to d6 and eventually go for the king side attack. Um, with new engines, uh, lines have been changed, new moves have been found, and opinions have changed. Um, so these days, bishop d6 is actually what I consider to be the main move and the main critical move. Um, there also used to be another line, um, bishop to f5. And now we get to the light square bishop. Um, in this cosmos structure, the main problem for black usually is this light square bishop. Um, the bishop on c8 uh, has very li uh, not very many active squares. The main active squares are either f5 or g4. Um, usually, my thump of rule in the cosmos structure is that when you get the bishop to either f5 or g4, without any problems, you should be doing all right with black. Especially if, for example, you manage to play the move bishop to f5 and white goes bishop to d3. If you manage to exchange this dark, uh, this light square bishop, you should be doing very, very fine with black. 
the reason for this is that um, we have two pawns in the center on light squares. So very often if you put the bishop to d7 or e6, it will just be looking towards his own pawn structure. And that makes the bishop very, very passive. So um, our uh, dark square bishop is very, uh, very dynamic, very active. It has many squares to go to. Well, the, and uh, from those squares, it will also have a very active purpose on the diagonals. While the light squared bishop doesn't have too many of those squares because of our pawn search. So if we manage to get our bishop to f5 or bishop to g4, we should be doing fine. However, in this position, um, there's a problem with the move bishop to f5, which is the move queen to f3. It attacks the bishop on f5, uh, which forces us to play a move. Um, usually black goes bishop to g6. And after bishop takes f6, queen takes f6 is the usual move. After g takes f6, we again have this pawn structure. Um, we're going to get this pawn structure anyway. After queen takes f6 as well, because white can take, take, and uh, simply play this position. Um, the thing about this position, however, is uh, that... It's just much easier to play for white. Uh, we do have the bishop pair to compensate for the pawn structure. I think it benefits black that the queens have been exchanged because our king uh, is a little bit exposed to this pawn structure. And also it's much harder to attack the pawns uh, without the queens on the board. So it definitely benefits black that the queens have been exchanged. However, um, the pawn structure is just so bad that probably white has a little bit of an edge here. A very important game as well in this position uh, was a game between Carlsen and Kramnik uh, in which Carlsen I think went knight to e2. The main move um, in this position is bishop to d6 um, and there was a very theoretical battle. Um, I'm trying to find, ah no sorry, I think the move was knight to f3, sorry, yeah. Knight to f3, black usually plays knight to d7. And the main strategy for white here is to try and occupy this f5 square. So uh, knight h4 makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kramnik played bishop to e2. And here Carlsen came up with the novelty. Uh, it was preparation of course. Um, but the novelty was knight to e2. And the idea is to bring the knight around to g3 and then occupy the f5 square. And probably white is a little bit better. Maybe black can try to hold but it's definitely not a lot of fun. So in this position, we cannot put the bishop to f5, but our problem actually is that um, on the next move, um, white will be playing either queen c2 or bishop to d3, after which the move bishop f5 has been prevented. So uh, right now we cannot really play it because it leads to slightly a better endgame for white, while if we wait one move, um, we cannot play it anymore. So we have a bit of a dilemma here. However, um, I think we just have to kind of allow the bishop to come to uh, d3. So one move uh, I like in this position is bishop to d6. Uh, bishop to d3 is the main move, stopping bishop f5. And the usual problem is that we also cannot put the bishop to g4 because this actually drops a piece. Um, if you're viewing the live stream, uh, try to find the, it's a nice little exercise, uh, try to find the winning way or winning variation for white in this position, if you're able to at least. Yeah, so uh, usually for the black position, the light squared bishop will become passive. Yeah, that's very true. Um, there's simply not a lot to do about that. Uh, we just kind of have to accept it. However, at some point it might become active. If we at some point manage to get it to f5 or at some point manage to get to g4, um, then it can definitely become active. So there, if right now it can be uh, passive, but at some point it might become active. Um, yeah, so people are suggesting the right move. Uh, bishop takes f6. Queen takes g4 doesn't win a piece because after knight takes g4, uh, bishop takes g4. Eight, king takes d8, uh, it's equal material. But bishop takes f6 this is a nice move. Uh, queen takes f6, queen takes g4 will be winning a piece. And after um, queen takes g, f sorry, uh, bishop takes f6, bishop takes d1, black will, uh, white will play bishop takes d8, 
um, we can take back the bishop, but after rook takes d1, we will be down a piece as well. So bishop g4 simply loses a piece, uh, which was the exact same case here, here as well. Move previously, uh, a move before. Um, bishop to g4, bishop takes f6 would also be uh, winning a piece for um, for white in the exact same way. So we cannot play bishop f5 or bishop g4 anymore. Instead we should castle. Um, usually as I said before, black castles kingside. We've already developed the knight to f6. We've already developed the bishop to d6. So it makes a lot of sense to castle kingside. For white, it's a bit different though. Um, white in these positions can either castle kingside or queenside because um, the reason for that is usually this plan of b5 uh, attacking on the queenside isn't as strong as it seems like um, because after you push b4 the knight will go to a4 the a pawn will be stopped on a5 the c5 break is very uh, difficult to get in because after d takes c5 you'll be left with an isolated pawn on d5 so the queenside attack is not as strong and um, also the king is of course recently uh, relatively safe on the g1 square as well so on each side it will be kind of safe so for white actually it is a question whether he goes kingside castles or queenside castles um, however usually against this setup with bishop to d6 white does castle kingside um, with the bishop on e7, it's more often that white castles queenside actually. But um, let's castle. Usually white plays queen to c2. And now white actually has a threat. Our knight on f6 is still pinned. So that means that our pawn on h7 is technically only defended by the king. So it's only defended once while it's attacked twice. So this is something you have to be careful of usually when playing these positions. So that you have to be a bit careful when the queen on c2 appears that the h7 pawn might be under attack um so we should be playing h6 it's with a temple on the bishop why doesn't want to give up the bishop pair so he plays bishop to h4 um and here we have to find the next move so in these structures it's mainly about piece play it's not about pawn play so we should be trying to improve our pieces there are not a lot of great pawn moves for black the usual problem is that our c5 break will be met with d takes c5 bishop to takes c5 and we will be left with a weak pawn on d5 even in this position white might also play knight takes d5 simply winning the pawn because the knight f6 is uh, pinned by the bishop on h4 however if white takes for example takes uh, you're usually left with this weak isolated pawn and it's not really something you're happy to go for with black so c5 is not a break you want uh, meanwhile the move b5 uh, weakens the c6 pawn uh, because, because it's, it cannot be protected anymore by either the b or the d pawn and it's on a half open c file so you're really weakening the c6 pawn so you have to it has to be in very special circumstances before you go b5 a5 however is a move that can often be played um, because actually uh, one of the main plans in this uh, structure for white is the minority attack. The minority attack basically means that um, you're attacking on one side where you have less pawns. So on the queen side, white has three pawns, while we have four pawns. Um, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to attack on the queen side, but um, white does anyway. And the reason for this is because the c pawn has been traded there isn't a half open c file for white to play on so because there is one pawn less it's a lot easier for white to play there because there's a lot more space for white than for black um so the minority attack is usually when white at some point goes b4 and then b5 trying to take on c6 hoping for b takes c6 and because then the pawn of c6 is not defended anymore by the uh, pawn on b7 it can become rather weak so the one of the main plans in these positions for white is to be playing b4 to b5 and then try to uh, take the pawn and eventually put pressure on it it's a very long-term plan but if white managed to achieve that uh, he has a very nice position so a5 is a very very common move in this position uh, to try and stop this b4 plan also at some point might white consider to castle queenside and then it makes a lot of sense as well to have the pawn on a5 because it gets closer to the king and at some point you might have an attack so a5 is a very common move 
let's have a look at the other pawn moves. Uh, H5 is left, but that really does make a lot of sense. It simply weakens our own king and the G5 square. So H5 doesn't make a lot of sense. And then we have left uh, G6 and G5. Um, usually, actually, um, G5 is just more of a weakening move. It gets rid of the pin, but after bishop to G3, it's mainly our own king who has been weakened, and the pawn on g5 doesn't really help with the attack. The king hasn't committed yet to the king side, so the pawn on g5 is more uh, of a weakening move than a, a strengthening move. Um, let's re really chat a little bit. Can you prepare to b see if I break with a move like b6? Yeah, that's very often a plan, eccentric, um, but not that common in these positions. Usually that's more often done when the pawn is still on c7, because if you go b6 and then c6, c5, it takes a lot of moves to uh, achieve that. Also, in the structure after b6, uh, let's say knight to f3, c5, d takes c5, b takes c5, these pawns can also become incredibly weak. It's an interesting pawn structure in general, but it's just very hard to achieve in these positions, because the pawns are just quite weak. White can at some point, for example, castle, put the rooks to uh, d1 and c1, and exert pressure on the d and c files. So it's not a very common plan, actually, in these positions to go for the b6 c5 break. So not a lot of great pawn moves. So um, that means that we have to go for the piece play. So we have to um, play with our pieces as actively as possible and try to improve them as much as possible. Um, so in this position, um, we want to have a look at the pieces that we have not uh, improved yet. And those are mainly the bishop on c8, knight on b8, rook on a8, and rook on f8. Our queen hasn't done much on, or hasn't gotten to a more active square on d8 yet. However, um, the queen is very flexible. At some point it can go to a5 in one go, can go to h4 in one go. And in, usually you don't want to play a queen move early on in the game, so... We want to keep the queen on d8 for the moment. Um, as I said, it's just rather difficult to develop the bishop. Bishop f5 is not possible anymore. Bishop to g4 could be considered. However, the problem is h3. Um, and we cannot go to h5 because after g4, bishop g6, uh, we are losing a pawn. Um, even if we weren't losing a pawn, this structure isn't so great with f takes g6. Um, so it's really not something we want to go for. So bishop g4 is not a move because our bishop uh, doesn't have a lot of great squares. Which means that for the moment being, uh, we should probably try to keep the bishop to c8. And at some point maybe it can go to an active square. Uh, actually I want to uh, go for a second to move g6. Um, it's very often a move actually to play the move g6. This is because at some point you want to achieve bishop to f5 to try and exchange these bishops. However, in this position it's probably not a great move because um, you need another piece to help the bishop get to f5. Usually this is uh, a knight. So one typical maneuver actually in these positions is um, rook to e8 and at some point go knight to d7, knight to f8, knight to e6 g6 knight to g7 and then bishop f5 however it's not really a great plan right now because we have already put the pawn on h6 and playing h6 together with g6 is not a great combination if you play for example in this position g6 um white might even consider sacrificing because we've opened up our king so much so um, playing g6 together with h6 in these structures is in general also not a great combination. So, as I said before, not a lot of great pawn moves uh, in the current position. Which, again, means that we should be trying to uh, be improving our pieces instead of our pawns. Um, so, which poof, which, yeah, I am reading to the chat, uh, Push Courage. Um, it's, I'm also trying to do the lecture, it's not uh, very, it's not very easy to keep up with chat, uh, answer all the questions, and also be um, like trying to say what I still want to say about the p current position. But I'm trying. Um, 
so um, we have to improve our pieces. Um, and the pieces that we need to improve, as I said, are the light square bishop, but it's not really able to yet. Uh, then we get to the knight, and I have something special in mind for the knight, but we are not there yet. Um, first, we can improve our rook. We In this position, white has the open c file, but we have the open e file. So it makes a lot of sense to put the rook to e8. Uh, let's get rid of all the arrows first. One of the reasons for this is uh, that simply the rook is more active in a half open a e file, and very often white castles king side, and on the king side the rook can very often go for a rook lift, and that helps us try and checkmate white. So the move rook d8 makes a lot of sense because um, it gets the rook simply to a more active square than it was on f8. Usually, uh, and this is actually the point where white has to make the very important uh, decision where he puts his knight, because. Um, right now he's basically developed all of his pieces. The queen is out, the bishop is out, the knight is out, the bishop on h4 is also out. So there are not a lot of ways to still improve white's position. And he's finally gotten it to that point that he's forced to choose whether to go knight to f3 or knight to e2. And very often the knight actually goes to e2 in these positions. The reason for that is after knight to f3, there's one big problem, which is uh, bishop to g4. And now, after h3, we might simply take on f3. I think also in general, against this setup with the bishop to d6, the knight on f3 doesn't make a lot of sense, because this e5 square is uh, quite well uh, protected. So, very often in the setups with the bishop to um, e7, the knight can go to f3, because from f3 it can jump to e5. However, here it's quite clear that it's very difficult to jump to e5, so knight to f3 is not a great move because the knight will not be doing much on f3. We can also play bishop to e6 and uh, followed by knight to d7, rook to c8 and then tr try to aim for the move c5. Um, no, there are not a lot of moments uh, there that I'm not thinking of chess. How about you go knight b e7? Yeah, so uh, very often the move is knight to d7. The problem for black uh, with putting the knight to d7 is that um, the knight doesn't have a great future on d7. There are not a lot of great squares where the knight can go to. Um, because that's uh, because the e5 square is uh, guarded by the pawn, the c5 square is guarded by the pawn, um, knight on b6 is not doing much, uh, can not go to a4, it might go to c4, but you don't really want to double your own pawns and get rid of the d5 pawn so the knight will also not go to b6 so in general i would try to not put the knight to d7 because it doesn't have a lot of great squares um it can maybe go to f8 eventually but there it will not be active as well so i had as i said before another square in mind for the knight so first let's improve the rook and now white should probably play knight to e2 because the knight is not so great in f3 and now I want to go with the move a5, stopping this minority attack usually, uh, or eventually, it's just a lot more difficult for um, white right now to go for the minority attack because the b4 square is quite well protected with the pawn a5 and the bishop. So it's quite difficult right now to go for this b4 plan. Um, and now, um, a question for if you're watching this stream, what would you be doing if your opponent castle in, uh, right now? What, what do you think is the best move in the current position? Yeah, I understand the idea um, behind knight bd7. Um, the problem is that the knight still doesn't have a great square on d7. Okay, maybe you can unpin the knight by playing some move like queen to c7. Um, however, the queen doesn't really have great squares. And um, the position is not about developing your queen. The position is more about getting your minor pieces and the rooks to great squares. Because eventually your um, 
uh, queen will find a great square anyway. The queen is so flexible that uh, it has the potential to get to any square basically. So it will always find a good square to go to anyway. So the point of the position is not to find a good square for the queen. Yeah, and as chat points out, bishop takes h2 is very strong. So this is an idea that white has to be very careful of. Um, and one of the reasons why I like this setup for black. And now after king h2, uh, we can play knight to g4 check. And we suddenly have a discover attack on the bishop. If white simply plays king to g1, we take the bishop and we go for a mating attack. Which means that our opponent has to go king to g3. Because of king h3, he runs into this diagonal, which can only lead to uh, bad things happening. So knight takes e3 here, wins the game. Uh, it's a check on the king, and also we attack the queen. So we'll be winning heavy material right now. So the king has to go to g3. But now after g5, uh, we will be winning back the bishop, and the king is on g3, which is a very bad idea. So in this position, um, white is in very bad shape. So castles bishop takes h2 is a trick uh, trick that white has to be very careful of. So instead white should probably play the move h3, preventing the king from castling and also stopping any bishop to g4 ideas. One idea by the way of putting the knight to e2 is that it's also more flexible in the sense of that eventually white might go f3 and then e4. Um, trying to grab the center and also trying to open up the f-file because there might be a rook soon entering on f1 and if the f-file gets open that will be great of course. So f3 e4 is eventually a plan for white maybe but that's uh, why we put the rook on the 8. With the rook on the 8 it's very difficult to go for this plan because if white for example plays f3 in this position we can simply take the pawn e3. So it's not an easy to achieve uh, plan to achieve. Yeah, a5 looks like a waiting move, uh, Munter, but I have a very special idea in mind. If white plays h3, then I want to go for an idea that Subham suggested, which is move knight to a6. And uh, that's why I wanted to keep the knight on b8. And this is definitely one plan to remember if you're planning to play this kind of structure, is that the knight can actually go to a6. The reason why you play a5 first is that if you start with the move knight to a6, um, white can again think of giving up the bishop pair to ruin your pawn structure and again you're left with a lot of weak pawns and now that the pawn on b7 is not defending c6 anymore there will be a lot of pressure on the c file so we first play a5 so that in this position after knight to a6 bishop takes a6 we can simply take back with the rook and now white has given up the bishop for nothing basically um, and meanwhile we're also threatening to play knight to b4 winning the bishop with a tempo um so we also have a threat right now um instead of h3 what about bishop g3 for white to stop bishop takes a2 idea and also if black has changed the bishop what gets the open file good question um if white plays the move bishop to g3 i will probably not take on g3 uh, because it does open the h file um i would instead probably play the move knight to a6 because um, now if white castles, we might actually then take, because after h takes g3, there isn't a rook anymore on the h-file. So we just play a simple waiting move. And as I said, in general, in these positions, we should be trying to exchange minor pieces. So we shouldn't be afraid of a move like bishop to g3. Uh, it does prevent bishop takes h2 check, but it, on the other end, it does eventually exchange a minor piece. So we should not mind about it too much. Um, so knight to a6 happened. Um, yeah, no problem, Derek. Uh, maybe see you another time. So knight to a6 happened. Yeah, you basically ignore bishop g3 LDO. And white should prevent it, uh, should prevent the knight to knight from coming to b4. So white should probably play the move a3. And um, now the knight again looks a bit silly because the knight cannot go to um b4 the knight cannot go to c5 but uh, we kind of went to a6 with a tempo we were threatening to go knight to b4 um, we cannot do it right now because it gets taken of course um, however there is one more square which is the c7 square and you might be wondering what what is the knight even doing on the uh, c7 however it has a great future ahead um, the idea of this knight maneuver is eventually 
to get to the g5 square. So we want to go to e6 and then go to g5. The, one of the reasons for this um, is that uh, white probably will not castle queenside anymore because he has gone to move a3. And now after the move b5, um, followed by a move like b4 or a4 followed by b4, um, we will be opening up the king side, uh, sorry, the queen side. Um, so we are getting to the king. Meanwhile, white is very far away from opening up the g file. So we'll be the first to attack. So it's very unsafe to castle queen side. Which means that white will probably castle king side. And then it makes a lot of sense to put our knight to uh, g5. Because on the g5 square, uh, it will be ve getting very close to the king. Also, on the g5 square, the knight is unpinning this, uh, sorry, this knight, because the knight will be blocking this bishop, which means that after the knight reaches the g5 square, we will be uh, able to play this knight towards a better square again. Um, the knight on e6, however, right now is blocking the um, e file. So it makes actually a lot of sense to be playing f3 right now because uh, white is threatening to play e4. If white gets an e4, we are in, in a lot of trouble probably with black because e4, uh, we don't really want to take it because it does open up the f file, uh, the f file creating pressure. And also um, after uh, white has gone e4, he is threatening to play e5, winning a piece with a double attack because the pawn is guarded by the pawn on d4. So e4 will come with a lot of force and we really don't want to allow it. We should probably continue with our plan uh, with knight to g5, putting pressure on the e file. So we are threatening rook takes e3. And the knight also puts pressure on the e4 square together with the rook. So there is a lot of pressure on e3. There is a lot of pressure on the e4 square, so it makes a lot of sense to put the knight to g5. However, the question right now is what if white plays e4 anyway? Because if d takes e4, f takes e4, um, why we did open up the f file, e5 is still coming, and we cannot take it because the pawn is just guarded well enough. Oh, sorry. Um, and also the knight was pinned, so we'll lose the queen here. Uh, bishop takes e4 would allow black to win the game, kind of be playing queen takes h4, but bishop d d8 simply wins the game. So, um, what to do after e4? Uh, does anyone in chat maybe know how to respond to this move? If you find this move, uh, you're probably a really strong player, so I'll give you some time to think about the position. Uh, there is a very, very strong move for black currently, but um, if you don't find it, uh, don't uh, yeah, it doesn't matter because it's in just a very difficult move to find. Knight takes h3 is um, suggested in chat. Um, it's an interesting sacrifice. Usually this is one of the ideas that we want to go for with uh, black. However, after takes, takes um, white can, for example, just play the move rook to f2. And there's not really an attack going on for it. So white just has a great position right now. Um, so that's not the move for black. Why doesn't white play rook b1 full by before continuing minority attack? So yeah, that's also one plan that white could have gone for. Um, however, if uh, black manages to go knight to g5, we have a very strong attack coming. With bishop takes h3, um, eventually the queen might enter. So uh, white doesn't really have the time to play for such a long-term plan with rook to b1. Uh, sorry for the background noise if you heard any. Um, yeah, queen c7 is suggested. Um, so the move that we currently should be playing should be uh, avoiding the move pawn to e5. Um, so um, either the, uh, queen c7 is, for example, not a great move because it does allow e5. Um, bishop e7 is... Uh, suggested but it's a bit of a passive move because it allows e5 and now white has a great pawn center he has gained a lot of space um c5 is also suggested um c5 is probably an interesting move i think however after e5 uh white is doing probably a bit better uh c takes d4 is a critical response to e5 
Um, but I think that the position after knight to b5 is quite difficult for black. Because after bishop takes e5, f4 we're losing a piece. So uh, we cannot take back on e5 in any way because f4 is coming. Which will make us lose material. Uh, because of a double attack. So c5 is not great. However, the best move in the position... Um, queen b6 is a move that does stop e5. That's very true. Um, white can probably just play bishop 2 f2, however, unpinning the pawn. And e5 is still coming. I'm instead gonna show you guys the correct move. It's a very, very surprising one. It's a very difficult one, so you're probably not gonna find it. The move that's very strong in the current position is knight f takes e4. Um, it's a, it's a very bold sacrifice and in general just very difficult to find. Um, it was suggested by Christopher at the end there. Um, the thing is that we're opening up this uh, diagonal. So after white takes back on e4, we're ready to sacrifice the other knight as well. And we go knight takes h3. Uh, opening up the diagonal for the queen to enter on h4. So uh black uh, white will take back on h3 we take on h4 and um as you can see we've completely opened up the king there's no g pawn there's no f pawn anymore um this bishop is about to enter and finally we get our bishop to a great square we've waited so long but the bishop on c8 actually was doing a good job of at some point uh trying to enter on h3 we've seen this before as well we we had the knight on g5 was that at some point um, we might be sacrificing with the bishop or the knight on h3, which means that finally the bishop has a uh, job to do. Um, so e4 happened, knight takes knight f takes e4, pawn takes e4, knight takes h3, pawn takes h3, queen takes h4, and um, now after rook to f2, trying to defend, finally the bishop enters the game. Are you secretly Michal Tal? Um, well, this is not a sacrifice I've made myself. Uh, I've been wanting... Oh, actually, I've once made this. Uh, I, I once played an online blitz game against Nisi Piano, a strong German grandmaster, in which I managed to actually get this exact position on the board. But this is actually known from a game Moesenko against Casa Curly. So it wasn't mine, uh, my idea at all. Um, Curly already played this in a game, and that's why I know it. Um, this is all kind of modern theory at this point, um, because it's actually not so easy to... Um, well, you can avoid this, but the thing is that this used to be critical until knight takes e4 was found. And now suddenly, the system is very interesting for white again. Yeah, it became very theoretical actually recently, audio. Um... So after this sacrifice, um, why is say basically getting checkmated? Um, the star move of the game actually wasn't knight f takes e4. The star move of the game was actually in this position. Um, maybe try to find this uh, the best move in this position. It, this one is a bit easier, I think, than the knight f takes e4 move. Uh, but try to find the best move here. How to refute from white? Um, the sacrifice is simply good for black, so there's no uh, way to uh, refute the sacrifice. It's simply simply good for black. But we have to find the right continuation. So we have to find a way to finish off white here. Um, the problem with bishop h2 is that the rook can actually take it. It will be brilliant if the king has to take it, because then we can take the rook perhaps, try and checkmate. But the rook can take it, so it doesn't really work out for uh, for black. So we have to find another move. Uh, queen to g4 is a check, but the problem is king to h1, and um, it's not so easy for, for black to finish off white. So queen g4 is not the move. Rook to e6 can be played with the idea rook to g6. However, the problem for uh, black is pawn to e5. And um, now after rook to g6, we can simply take it. So uh, rook to e6 is a bit too slow. So the right idea has already been found. Uh, we want to have the rook enter the game, which is why we put the rook on the 8 in the first place. We have to uh, be a bit more extreme though. 
we have to play the move rook to e5 instead. Um, there is no way to prevent the rook coming to g5 instead of taking it. But that would allow the bishop to come to c5. And now all of a sudden, um, this diagonal is opened up. And there is basically a mating threat on f2. Yeah, well, it's a nice find, Duffin. Uh, rook to e5 is a very, very nice move. Um, so in this position, uh, white has to defend the f2 rook. So he jumps with the knight in between. Gaining some time because white uh, black has to take. Meanwhile, the rook has been defended. However, white is still, uh, black is still having a lot of threats. He's currently threatening to play queen to g3. Um, after which uh, king to h1 is forced and then we can take the rook. So white defends the rook. Um, but <clears throat> it's simply too late for white to save the position right now. Because you can play queen to g3, forcing king to h1, and now bishop to g4. Threatening to play bishop to f3, forcing rook takes, and then we have checkmate. So white went bishop to f1, bishop to f3 check. As I said, white cannot take it because you have checkmate. Um, so instead white went for the move bishop to g2. However now, queen to h3, check came. Forcing the king to g1 as the bishop was pinned on g2 by this bishop. So king to g1. And now we'll be checkmate finally. So a uh, very, very nice game. And this is really my uh, model game give for the uh, queen's gambit declined. Uh, I'll click through it once more. You can also re uh, see the stream once again. But um, it starts with d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6, takes, takes, bishop to g5, c6, defending d5, e3. And now we want to go for the setup with bishop to d6, castles, we have to go h6, and then rook to e8. And in this position, we go for the plan with a5, knight to a6, knight to c7, knight to e6, knight to g5. So that's kind of uh, the summary on how to play this position for black. And uh, really something I look forward to producing uh, once myself on the over the board game. Classical game would be very nice. Why didn't White play Rook F1 directly instead of giving the Knight? Good question. I'll go back to that moment a bit. Um, so we had this position. Um, Rook to F1 was uh, a move. However, the problem for White is that I can just take it. Um, getting rid of the defender of the uh, f2 rook and you cannot take with the rook because it's pinned and if you take with the king then you're still getting checkmated so uh, rook to f1 doesn't really help white do you have ragozin in store for us ragozin is also an interesting move uh, or an opening um, the ragozin for those who don't know is uh, the line which can arise from this Usually uh, white goes c takes d5, but if white goes knight to f3, you have bishop to b4, which is the Ragozin. I'm not sure if I'll be doing a session on the Ragozin once on coaches. Might be something that can be covered once on coaches, but it's not up to me to decide uh, what's what's being streamed on coaches. Um, so, but there might once be a session on uh, Ragozin, so <laughs> make sure to uh, keep on watching the coaches streams. Uh, why does white h3 a lot in these... Um, well, the reason I explained before why white plays the move h3 is because um, black's main problem is his bishop on c8. This uh, square on f5 is guarded pretty well, but this square on g4 is not uh, guarded that well. So uh, one of the reasons why white goes h3 in these positions is simply to eventually prevent the bishop coming to g4. Also, white wants to castle kingside, and as we have seen after the immediate kingside castle, we can play the move bishop takes h2. Um, so one of the reasons is that you don't want to allow bishop takes h2, and the other is that you don't want to allow bishop to come to g4. Can I play this opening after this stream? Until which rating is this enough? Um, well, the, the model game that I've shown, um, if you remember this game, uh, this was a 2600 player being defeated with white. 
Um, so an international master, I think the black player was um, kind of making him look like a. Yeah, I don't want to offend anyone, but like a like a baby or something. He really got uh, defeated quite badly, to be honest. Um, so you can defeat very very strong players with this. Objectively, also this is completely fine for black. Um, it's not easy at all to even prove an advantage for white, even if there might not even be one. So I think at any level you can play this. And at the World Rapid Championships um, last year, this exact position was also played by Magnus Carlsen. Magnus played this position with black uh, against, uh, I think, Salem, a uh, 2600 plus player with white. So even at the very highest level it can be played, so anyone can play this opening. Um, yeah, this stream will be saved, Monter, if you want to watch back. Isn't a variation where Black plays Bishop before called the Nimzu Indian and not the Red Gozen? Yeah, so um, the Nimzu Indian is knight to f6 in this position, c4, e6, knight to c3, and now bishop to b4. The Red Gozen is something else. The Red Gozen is the position after knight f3, d5. However, uh, very often white doesn't play knight to f3 in this position, for example. I think the main line these days is e3. Um, so this doesn't lead to the red goes in because white doesn't put his knight in f3. Usually the red goes in arises after white plays knight f3 in this position. Black goes d5, knight c3, and now black goes bishop to b4. What if white plays f4 instead of f3, or is e3 too weak in your mono game? Yeah, so actually in that game between... Um, Magnus Gosson and uh, Magnus at black in the game between Salem and Magnus. Uh, Salem actually went f4 in this position, and Magnus went complete berserk. He went g5 in this position, which is a very bad move. He did win the game, it was a rapid game, so he kind of got away with this. However, I think after the move, bishop, uh, pawn to f4, e3 does get a bit weak, and we now should be playing for a bit of a more solid approach. I like usually the approach bishop e7. And basically now we want to get rid of this pin and we just enjoy this uh, pawn being weak. Uh, one of the plans is for example knight to f8 and then this knight to h7 because it's now guarded. And then we've gotten rid of this diagonal or the pressure. Another plan might be also to play knight to h5. So for example rook d1 which is a very logical move. Um, we can play two moves. One is knight to h5 and the other is the knight to f8 plan which is actually very common in these positions after f4 knight to f8 back and now you want to go um knight to h7 next exchanging off the bishops at some point maybe some b5 b4 um but the problem for white in these positions is that the king side attack usually isn't really working out and meanwhile it's very hard to push e4 because then the d4 pawn gets uh, isolated so this setup with bishop to e7 back because white has weakened his position with f4 Followed by knight of eight is perfectly fine for black. What if I place? Um, also, by the way, um, f4 is uh, simply a mistake in this position. Uh, the reason for that is because you can play f3 in this position. And after knight to g5, you can now play f4. N the sacrifice in h3, I thought, was not working out for black. It might actually... Ah, wait, I think this sacrifice might be working. Uh, needs to be checked with a better engine, maybe. Um, but there was a reason why... Yeah, the reason why f4 is a mistake is because you can, for example, play the move rook t1 in this position. I think black usually plays... Or you could consider playing knight to g5. And now f4. And now because the rook is on e1, this sacrifice is not supposed to be working out. Um, probably because you can just place a move like knight to g3 and just get rid of the rook on e3 and there are not a lot of attackers. So you have to retreat. And now white has kind of won a full tempo on this line. You can still play this setup with bishop e7, knight to f8 however. Because the position is not a very dynamic position. It's more of a static position which we're trying to play against the e3 weakness. So it doesn't matter too much that we have lost this tempo. We are quite happy that the pawn has come to f4 and white has permanently weakened the e3 pawn. Also, um, you might be playing the move bishop to d7 here, a little bit of a waiting move. 
because now after f3 we can again go knight to g5 um and also one other plan that we might be going for is b5 and we're creating a lot of counterplay but um the objective evaluation or the the best move in these positions i don't know by heart uh, I once checked this with good engines and objectively this should be quite okay, I, I believe. So it's you can definitely play this at any level. Is the Queen's Gambit decline considered drawers at the top level? Uh, the thing is that the Queen's Gambit decline doesn't get played so often anymore. But I think we might see a little bit of a revival due to this bishop to d6 setup. Um, I think actually this is a very, very fighting opening. Um, if you play bishop to f5, it's more of a drawish weapon. Because you're trying to go for this end game uh, with queen to f3 and then try to hold this end game. But if you go for the bishop to d6 line, you actually keep all the pieces on the board. Um, which means that you will for sure get a very fighting position. Um, it's just that this bishop d6 line hasn't really been played yet. Which is why uh, people might consider the queen's game decline more of a drawish weapon. But it, I don't think it is. The, it simply depends on the way you want to play it. Should I consider giving up my light square bishop earlier in the game as most of my pawns are on light squares? Yeah, uh, very often the strategy is actually that you exchange the light square bishop, especially against the light square uh, bishop of, that white has. Very often you will not manage to do this, but um, very often you're actually also quite happy to be exchanging the light square bishop for a knight. Um, that is because the bishop on c8 in general is not so great. So you might even consider giving it up for knight, and it's not at all bad. Because it's very often simply your worst minor piece. Knight 3 gives equal as per engine after f4. Yeah, could be. It needs to be checked with a strong engine jo uh, and strong engine though. Uh, because very often the online engine doesn't really get and doesn't calculate very deeply. But um, I think I'm going to be ending the stream for tonight. I hope you enjoyed the lecture on the uh, Queen's Gambit Decline. There's a lot more to the Queen's Gambit Decline than I've explained today. Um, there's a lot more to cover. Uh, we, for example, didn't really cover setups with Bishop to e7, uh, which are also very interesting. Um, there's a lot still to be explored. There are still things that we don't know. As you saw in this Bishop d6 line, it's quite uh, new actually. I think it's basically one, two years old that people have started to play this line again. Um, but um, I would definitely recommend you to look up the Moe Senko against Curly game again or rewatch this stream to try and get moves. Um, I hope you like the, like the stream of tonight and I'll probably be back next week. Um, 